A very good morning, all of you. So today's live session will focus on MCQ's discussion from adverse effects of NSI, from which we had a textbook discussion in the previous live session. So I see you guys answering questions. Uh, appreciate your enthusiasm. So as I said, we have a scoring system. So plus four for right answers, minus one for wrong answers. I mean, for no answer, you'll be getting more negative score of minus two. And you can add up a bonus of plus 12 overall if you think you have actually participated in this session. Okay, so I hope you guys are ready. So let's start with our first question. So as you can see, frontal headache. I'll review your answers at the end of the session, but we'll start from here. Frontal headache is a very common adverse effect associated with which of the following NSIDs? Aspirin, ibuprofen, ketorolac, indomethacin. So which one do you think is more appropriate answer? Frontal headache. So uh, think of enemies uh, who always uh, wish to uh, create some nonsense in India. So the moment they think of India, they get this frontal headache. So just remember that the endomethacin, indo frontal headache. Also, uh, it's endomethacin is considered as a potent prostaglandin inhibitor, and also it affects neutrophil motility. Consider this very, very important. And there are some serious adverse effects. Apart from frontal headache, which is very common, there can be dizziness, mental confusion, hallucination, psychosis, as we have discussed yesterday. Okay, very good. Now, let's move on to the next question. Dry mouth, aphthous ulcers, and taste disturbances, including paresthesias, are associated with which of the following NSIs? Celicoxib, paricoxib, etoricoxib, paracetamol. So which one do you think is more appropriate answer? See, when you try to eat something, uh, you're not able to enjoy your food because you're having ulcers. You're having dry mouth. Etori, eat, etoricoxib, right? So as you know, these are COX-2 inhibitors. Selective COX-2 inhibitors, good. Etoric oxid, you have the following. Adverse effects, dry mouth, taste disturbances, paresthesias, aphthous ulcers, okay? Wonderful. Now, it seems like a cakewalk uh, because you had gone through a student's textbook discussion. Wonderful. Now, let's move on to the next question. Look into the question carefully. Preferential COX-2 inhibitors. Preferential COX-2 inhibitors, which are associated with Fulminant hepatic failure. Fulminant means sudden and intense or severe. So which of the following preferential COX-2 inhibitor is associated with hepatic failure? Fulminant hepatic failure. And as a consequence, it's banned in some of the countries as we discussed yesterday. And its specific indication seems to be asthmatic patients or those who develop bronchospasm in response to aspirin because those uh, guys do not cross-react with the following drug. So which one do you think is more appropriate? You know, cakewalk. Nemesilide, wonderful. So nemesilide, recent evidence suggests that uh, there are cases of fulminant hepatic failure. Okay, good. Now let's move on to the next question, assertion and reason. Dentists should avoid prescribing NSAIDs in late pregnancy is the assertion. Reason. NSIs are found to promote premature closure of ductus. So let me know whether both the statements are true or false. Also let me know whether reason justifies assertion. So obviously, as we discussed in one of the recorded videos previously, analgesics in pregnancy, we don't prescribe NSIs, especially in late term or in late pregnancy. Yeah, both assertion and reason are true and reason justifies assertion because they are found to promote premature closure of ductus arteriosus. You know, the surprising and interesting fact is if at all there is patent ductus arteriosus, the moment the baby is born, uh, in order to uh, close uh, that uh, ductus arteriosus, we give small doses of either indomethacin or aspirin in order to uh, close this ductus arteriosus, right? So it seems to be a problem in one instance. It seems to be a solution in the other instance. So uh, in order to simply understand all of this, try to go through the uses and the functions of prostaglandins. 
as you know, prostaglandins are essential for maintaining ductus arteriosus, patency of ductus arteriosus for fetal circulation, but it has to be closed after delivery. If it's not closed, then we can therapeutically induce certain, uh, give smaller doses of aspirin or endomethacin to achieve closure. Right? In normal instances, how does ductus arteriosus close? It's mentioned that there are some unknown mechanisms. Okay, right. Very interesting information. We can go through that. Good. Assertion and reason are true, and reason justifies assertion. Next question, PG synthesis inhibition can lead to, again, uh, before you answer this, you can retract your previous answers before you answer this and um, uh, go through the question very carefully. PG synthesis inhibition can lead to gastric ulceration, sodium water retention, antipyrosis, only A and C. So which one do you think is more appropriate answer? See, even though we're talking about adverse effects, the question clearly states that PG synthesis inhibition. See, you should get this concept right. PG synthesis inhibition can have beneficial actions, therapeutic actions, desired actions, and also can have certain toxicities. So no matter what it is, PG synthesis inhibition can lead to gastric ulceration, sodium and water retention because of decreased renal flow, antipyrosis, anti-inflammatory action, antithrombotic, so everything. So all would be more appropriate answer, as most of you rightly mentioned. Okay, even antipyrosis is because of PG synthesis inhibition, isn't it? And inflammatory is also because of PG synthesis inhibition. So even though we're discussing in the context of adverse effects, the question here clearly states, I've created the question, uh, so as to make sure that you're getting the concept right. PG synthesis in inhibition can have both beneficial as well as toxic potential, uh, given the uses or functions prostaglandins have. I hope it's clear. Right. Now, moving on to these memory-based questions. So I, have, I haven't given you options. Let's see how many of you are going to get it right. Fatal dose of aspirin in adults, fatal dose of paracetamol in adults. So what's the fatal dose? Good. So fatal dose of aspirin is 15 to 30 grams as such. But per kg body weight, serious complications or serious toxicity can be seen when the levels are more than 50 milligrams per kg body weight. Whereas fatal dose of paracetamol, serious toxicity can be seen when the dose is, is more than 150 milligrams per kg body weight. But potential, uh, fatal potential is when the levels are more than 250 milligrams per kg body weight, which can be converted into a whole number when you multiply that with an average weight, 70 kg, right? Yeah, good. More than 250 milligrams per deciliter. Not deciliter, sorry. It has to be kg weight. More than 250 milligrams per kg body weight. Yeah, Neha, do check out your units once. Per kg body weight, right? We're trying to measure or quantify per kg body weight or whole as such. Wonderful. Now, last question. Pain at injection site is associated with pyroxicam, tenoxicam, keterolac, paracetamol. Now, don't say the moment uh, I give injection, there will be pain irrespective of the drug. Okay, that's okay. But in specific, characteristically, pain at injection site is considered as an adverse effect because of the nature of the drug in which of the following instances. So you have pyroxicam, tenoxicam, keterolac, Paracetamol. Yeah, yeah. another uh, classic uh, case, Keterolat. Good. Now, I have some homework questions for you. And before I give you those questions, now do answer this question. Like, you've gone through a textbook discussion yesterday. You tried answering questions today. There was a gap of 24, uh, around 24 hours or less than 24 hours. Do you think you can answer in the same manner if I pose the same questions two or three months later or just before the exam? I'm going to give you the same set of questions. These are obviously memory based. Uh, some logic is incorporated uh, uh, given the therapeutic action. But if I'm going to give you the same questions, maybe after a few weeks or few months, do you think you're going to answer in the same manner as accurately as you have answered now? These memory-based topics, 
we tend to forget them. Uh, we have very short memory span, especially conscious memory. Like after one week, you might struggle answering these questions or after one month, you might totally forget. But what really matters here is repeated revision. So we had gone through textbook discussion yesterday. So we have highlighted certain important points. And some of you have sent me notes of that highlighted points. And it's really wonderful to see that notes. And all it takes is uh, 10 to 15 minutes for you to revise all the adverse effects one week later or just a matter of five minutes to revise the same from your notes uh, one month later or two months later. If you revise, don't you think you can answer them again with confidence and accuracy? So that's the point I'm trying to make here. You might forget. That's absolutely fine. But your notes is something which is going to help you improve your confidence and most important it's going to save your time because now you might take some 30 to 40 minutes but later on you hardly need 5 to 10 minutes so this is a practical demonstration to uh, allow you know the importance of notes allow you know the importance of standard textbook references and repeated revision take my word right so i hope you got my point and I'll see you again tomorrow at 11 a.m. in standard time. We actually shifted the timing from 10.30 to 11. So 11 a.m. is fine, I guess. And you have the following homework questions. You can make a note, get back through mail for discussion. I'll let you know and guide you accordingly, okay? The first question, exactly, revision. Notes, preparation, and revision is the only mantra we have here. That's it. If you forget them, if you forget like uh, which uh, NSI is associated with frontal headache, uh, it's not a crime. It's absolutely fine uh, that we as humans tend to forget, but it's only through a practical implementable methodology, uh, an efficient methodology is going to help you and save you before the exam or on the day of exam. I'm saying before the exam because it's the time where uh, the emotions are high. We have a lot many questions, a lot of uncertainty. During those vital times, it's your notes, it's your confidence that's going to help you to a greater extent. Nothing else. Take my word. Okay. So the first homework question is Indomethacin, the same one, Indomethacin is used as a reserve drug in conditions requiring potent anti-inflammatory actions, in, like in case of acute gout or ankylosing spondylitis. So in such cases where we need a very potent anti-inflammatory drug, we don't go for indomethacin as a first choice of drug. Rather, it's used as a reserve drug in such conditions. Why? Why is indomethacin used as a reserve or secondary drug? In spite of uh, the fact that we have seen that, uh, and we have discussed as well, that indomethacin is a very potent PG inhibitor. But still, it's used as a, a reserve drug. Why? And second question, selective COX-2 inhibition is associated with cardiovascular risk such as myocardial infarction or heart attack. So what's the relation? Uh, is there any relation? If yes, what's the relation? Relation between selective COX-2 inhibitors and cardiovascular risk, which we haven't discussed yesterday. So I tried to incorporate that in homework question. And the third question and the final question is, administration of higher doses of aspirin leads to compensated respiratory alkalosis, which leads to uncompensated metabolic acidosis. In fact, one of you were asking me this question yesterday. I asked you to refer. I don't know who. I don't exactly remember who. Yeah. Kaushik, why Keterolac? Do refer and get back through mail. I'll be more than happy to guide you. Okay. So yesterday, one, one of you were asking me, like, how this aspirin is related to this respiratory alkalosis or metabolic acidosis. So I framed that question and do let me know administration of higher doses because analgesic dose is not associated with this respiratory alkalosis, but anti-inflammatory dose or even higher doses is associated with respiratory compensated respiratory alkalosis, which leads to uncompensated metabolic acidosis. It's like a chain of event. I wanted to uh, just refer the textbook and get back to mail. It's going to be very, very interesting. And also it's very important. Okay. Right. So you have any questions whatsoever, I want you to refer standard literature, use doubt clarification form format and get back through mail. You'll get a reply within 24 to 48 hours, right? So I hope this session is informative. 
recap is not necessary, right? Or do you want me to summarize all that we have discussed so far? It's up to you. By the way, post your scores. Do post your scores in the meantime. Yeah. Urvi, I have repeated the question, right? I hope it's clear. So do post your scores. And you can add plus 12. I'm not going to decide that, but you can add plus 12 to your total tally if you think you have actually participated. You know what active participation is? I, I need not define that, right? So to summarize all that we have discussed so far, frontal headache is one of the most common adverse effects associated with endomethacin. Along with that, we have psychosis, mental, uh, you know, mental disturbances, hallucinations. So all those adverse effects were clearly stated yesterday itself. And dry mouth after sulfur taste disturbances are associated with which are the following etoric oxid. Preferential cox inhibitor associated with fulminant hepatic failure. So we have seen yesterday nimucilide, which is also banned in certain countries, European countries, as well as uh, US. And also it's clearly mentioned that it has a specific indication for asthmatic patients as they do not cross react with uh, those who are allergic to aspirin do not cross react with nimucilide. Another take home message. And assertion and reason we don't prescribe NSAIDs late term or in late pregnancy because because of PG uh, inhibition, there can be certain adverse effects like premature closure of ductus arteriosus, okay? And PG synthesis inhibition can lead to which of the following? It can be the beneficial or it can be adverse effect, but these are the effects which we see. So beneficial effect would be antipyrosis, whereas adverse or toxic effects would be gastric ulceration, sodium water retention, also bleeding. Fatal doses, so these values are very important. Do memorize them, okay? 15 to 30 grams fatal dose of aspirin and fatal dose of paracetamol is more than 250 milligrams per kg body weight. And children are more susceptible because of their complete lack of glucuronidation or conjugation potential. And pain at injection site is associated with ketorolac. As we've seen, it has one of the adverse effects associated with ketorolac. And the homework questions, why is endomethacin used as a reserve drug in cases where we need a potent anti-inflammatory action, such as in case of acute gout or ankylosing spondylitis. The second homework question is, what's the link between selective cox inhibition and cardiovascular risk? And the third question, administration of high doses of aspirin leads to compensated, I mean, leads to respiratory alkalosis, which is compensated through a mechanism, which further leads to un compensated metabolic acidosis. Do inquire, refer, find out what this is all about and you can get back through mail for further guidance, right? So I hope it's clear and I'll see you again tomorrow at 11 a.m. Indian Standard Time and let me review your scores. Yes, Rishabh, yeah, you can just find out the difference between adverse effect and secondary effect and you can get back through mail. All homework questions will be discussed only through mail. So guys, did you get the homework questions? Okay, good to see all uh, all scores. Ritika, starting from Ritika. <laughs> okay, Rahil said, no need of recap. Sorry, Rahil, I haven't seen your message. It's too late. Ankur, sir, can you write these questions for us? Of course, I will write them for you, Ankur. Do you want me to come to your place also? Ishita, it's not extra one for active participation, extra 12. I'm giving you extra 12 for active participation. So that the total score comes to 50. Okay, wonderful. Wonderful to see all your scores. Last question, what's the relation between administration of high dose of aspirin with respiratory alkalosis? That's it. Yeah, you're most welcome. And I'll see you again tomorrow. Take care. Bye.